Some come back home in, uh, in one piece. Some come back home with uh, parts of body missing. And some back come back home in a coffin. Who's going to be the next? Is it going to be me? I felt an unease at that very, very morning. Um, I don't know why, I don't know how, but it was a different feeling altogether. Um, but even before that, we, we get, we, we get a, we got attacked every every single day when we when we go out. Even when we were in in our our, our base, our forward base camp, we we got attacked. We got mortared every single day, even during patrol, and that was was normal. And uh, but the feeling, the emotion that I felt that very morning on the 19th of July 2007 was completely different. What I always do is uh, I always have a, a morning devotion. And uh, uh, what I mean by that is that I, I used to read my Bible and, um, and I pray every morning when I, when I was in Afghanistan. But I uh, had a call from, from our, our boss uh, telling me that you need to, to wake, wake the other lads so that we had to go and uh, clear helicopter landing site. So we set off and uh, clear the helicopter landing site in the middle of the dark, uh, very early hours of the morning. And then straight after that, we were tasked to go to this high ground so that we can have a good view of the area before the, the helicopter come, uh, come and, and land or come and pick us up that morning. And as we, we, we parked our vehicle, on, on that um, hill, I just knew that something was about to happen because the stillness of that very morning was different from every other morning. The only thing that I could hear was the sound of Island Rover. And as we reversed the vehicle, because I said to the driver, uh, to one of my brothers, uh, the guy that was driving, could you reverse the vehicle a little bit further back? I, I just want to have a good view of the rear of the vehicle. I took a glance into a distance and, and I saw this thing, this, this local man standing from a distance on a, near a, a mud house. And that just triggered something in me that we're about to be attacked. And within seconds, within seconds, I was up in the air. So as I took a glance down to that lone man that was standing like from a distance near to a mud house, that's when our Land Rovers move a little bit further back. And that's when the rear right wheel of our Wemic Land Rover step onto this hidden 44 gallon drum was cut in half. And inside this 44 gallon drum, the enemy placed two plates of anti-tank mines and they filled the drums with, uh, with hundreds and hundreds of ball bearings, metals and six inches of nails. And within seconds, the vehicle, myself, were up in the air. The last thing I remember was uh, making my, my machine gun ready. And the next thing I remember was I was lying on rocks. The blast was so massive. I remember there was like a massive like black wall that came in front of me. That, that, I remember that. It was like the smoke that came from underneath the vehicle. It ripped through our, our Wimic Land Rover. Uh, 
and uh, within that that massive explosion my two colleagues got thrown out and then the next thing I remember was was lying on rocks <sighs> not knowing that my legs were gone because I was in in shock mode and I could hear like explosive were like going off as well because we had we had hundreds and hundreds like thousands of ammunition in our vehicle and explosive as well and and those were like going off as well at the same time and when I when I when I heard that and when I saw what what I saw that morning um, I just knew that I'll be going back to the UK in a coffin. I knew that I won't say goodbye to my wife. I knew that I won't say goodbye to my brothers, to my colleagues, my comrades. I started to, to see the world like spinning. And because, because when, when I looked down, when I saw what I saw, like there were like two open cuts at the end of my, my legs. My right legs, my right leg was was like completely off. Like my 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 leg was was missing on my right right leg. My left leg was like there were like bones and uh, and skin, and my like muscle was just hanging. I could see my my sin bone was just hanging the end of my, my left knee. And, um, and everything that I, I was wearing that day, like my bulletproof vest, I had my nine millimeter pistol that was on my, my side, my right side as well, that though, all those got blown off. And everything that, that was, was attached to me before the explosion was gone. I remember looking down that the only thing that was left was my undergarment and a few pieces of my, my shirt that I was wearing that morning in a t-shirt. And apart from that, everything was gone. People were screaming, like my, my comrades, my brothers from the other vehicle. And I could hear, cause I was lying on, on the ground. I could hear like the way boots were pounding. It was the sound of them running towards where I was. And I remember looking up to the sky and, uh, and I said a prayer. And this was my prayer that very morning, the 19th of July, 2007. I said, dear Lord Jesus Christ, if it's your plan to, to use me to motivate and encourage others, please give me life again. But if not, I am surrendering my body, soul, and spirit to you now. The next thing I remember was was like my my comrades who came to rescue me that day. Um, all I could hear was, Derek, be strong. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. We had to take you now. We had to take you now to a waiting helicopter. So the the evacuation that they did that very morning was was so quick. Uh, I remember they, they put me onto like um, a poncho and they just chucked me in in, in, in a waiting helicopter. Um, and that was it. And then the last thing I remember was uh, lying on a table in like in a room and, and I, I knew that was combustion. When, when a nurse was talking to me, she, she was standing right above my, my head, telling me, Derek, be strong, you're gonna be okay. And uh, the, I was like going in and out of consciousness as well at the same time. Like she was talking to me like inside a tunnel because every word that she was telling me was echoing and, and every, Every, every light that I, that I saw when I was lying on a table 
was covered in red. All I could see was any light that I saw in that room or in that operating room in that field hospital in, in, uh, in combustion in Afghanistan was, was red. And I remember like my, my, my spirit was, was looking down and I saw my body lying on the table. I think, I believe the same nurse was, was talking to me that very moment was standing round about that operating table. And I saw a few doctors, like, they were standing ar around the table as well. And I saw like the body bag on the side as well. I saw like the same nurse holding a, a hose pipe and cleaning my body, which was covered in blood. That's when I knew that I had this outer body experience. It was a terrifying moment and, and it's so unreal um, to experience what I've experienced that, that very day. And uh, when I saw the body bag, I, I just knew that, oh, that's, that's my body. I'm about to be put in that bag and into a coffin. Part of me knew that I would be going back in the UK in a coffin. But part of me was never giving up. Even though that I knew that I, ah, this is it, this is it. But part of me, I don't know whether my spirit or my, 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 my soul was just reminding myself that no, I am, not, I am not giving up. I am not giving up as yet. I, have, I will have to fight this. And one of our medical staff did this last check and found that you had a, a slight pulse. So from that, from that very moment, everything changes. Because I believe that when I was pronounced dead, th there were like procedures to be taken, has already been, been, been put together. And, and when, when that, that, that moment, when that medical staff felt that I had, I had a slight pulse, they changes everything. For me, until this day, I, I always remind myself that I am so blessed to be alive today. I always say that I now live on borrowed times because I was pronounced dead in 2007, on the 19th of July, 2007. And to be alive and well uh, today, um, I'm always grateful and, and I'm very humbled by the experience that I, I, I went through. And, uh, and I'm always thankful, I'm always in debt, and I will always be in debt to the team that rescued me from the battlefield, my, my colleague, my, the, 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 the medic, the Czechs, uh, Czechs uh, SAS soldiers, they were there on the day and there were a few American soldiers as well, I will always be in debt to them. And most of all to the medical team in Kimbashian and the medical team in Sally Oak, because I believe without them, I, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah, I think when I, when I came out from, from the coma after nine days, um, I think the first, first thing I saw was, uh, was my wife standing beside the bed. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was, uh, what is she doing here? This is Afghanistan. I thought I was still in Afghanistan. And uh, because I was strapped onto, onto the bed and I couldn't move because of the severity of the injury, because uh, I had, uh, I fractured my two, three spinal as well. And I had like fractures, ribs, like fractured left clavicle, uh, like, like I had bruising cuts all over my body. Uh, I was in a mess. And, uh, and when I saw my wife standing beside the bed, I, I said to her, what are you doing here? I, I couldn't even talk because my throat were, was swollen as well because I believe it when, when the blast took place, I took in like some of those black, black smoke during the explosion.
So I couldn't, I couldn't speak that loud. I, I was just like uh, whispering to my wife and telling her, what are you doing here? This is the battlefield, this is Afghanistan. And when she responded, I could see was tear, tear running down her face. She said to me, you are no longer in Afghanistan. You are in the UK, you are in hospital. I said, what? You are in the UK. And then, because I couldn't move around, I just like, look around like the ceiling. I saw, I saw like the window, because I was lying, my bed in ceiling was right by the window. And then I, I, I just remember my, reminded myself that, yeah, this is not Afghanistan. This is somewhere different. And then I, uh, I remember my wife kept on repeating every word that she was telling me. And then the next thing I remember asking my wife is that, can I go to the toilet? Because an amputee, we still feel that our legs are still intact. And uh, that was the same feeling that I felt that morning when I came out from the coma. And I said to my wife, can I go to the toilet, please? And then I remember she just did this. And then she said, no, you can't. You can't go to the toilet. And then I insisted, like, more than once, I said, please, can I go to the toilet, please? And then she said, no, you can't. You can't go to the toilet. She couldn't say that I got no legs. What she did was she took a picture of me and showed me the picture. And she said to me, this is you now. You got no legs. You can't go to the toilet. So when I saw what I saw that, that morning, I, uh, I just lost it completely. I lost hope of being alive. I, I just wanted to give up. I, I remember what was going into my mind was that first instant, within, within that few seconds when I saw the picture, that my body was just up to my above my knee height was, what's the point of being alive? I, I won't be able to, to take care of my family anymore. I won't be able to put food on the table to pay the bill. What's the point of being alive? I'd rather die than survive. Those were the, the first instant thought when I came to my mind, when I saw the picture. But after a few like minutes or so, I, when I was looking at my wife, all she was doing was like, tears were, was running down her face. I remember she, she, she wanted, or I thought she wanted to, to control her emotions, but she couldn't because like the tears was running down her face, it was uncontrollable. And, uh, and I remember telling my wife to come closer. I just knew that I have to take this first step to be strong because if I don't do this, then it's going to be a long journey for the both of us. So I said to my wife to come closer and, and I said to her, do you know what? Even though that I'm, I'm in this state, even though I lost my legs, I'm just so thankful that I'm alive today. But while I was saying this to my wife, the memory of the soldiers that I bid farewell to before I lost my legs in Afghanistan were just right there. I was just like seeing the replay of what I went through before my injury, saying goodbye and saluting my comrades, our comrades, those who couldn't make it back. When I was saying this to my wife, those were the memories were like repeating into, into my mind. And I said to her, do you know what? Even though that I'm, I'm in this state, I've got no legs. All I can say is that, let's start again. Let's start again. And from that day, 
I, I believe it was around August time in 2007 when, when I came around after nine days in a coma. From that day till today, I've never looked back, never. I've, uh, I'm always thankful for the opportunity to be alive and well. I'm always thankful and humbled by the experience that I was pronounced dead once, but now I'm living, I'm living now and, and I'm here to tell the story, to tell the tale and to share my experience and to encourage people that think that you cannot start, start all over again. My experience was that I died, I was pronounced dead, I was in a mess. Even the doctors told me on those few, few, um, few days when I came around from the coma, the few first days in Selyuk Hospital, I remember like the, the doctor sergeant told me and, and his medical staff that, Derek, if you're, gonna be, if you're gonna survive this injury, you're gonna be in the wheelchair for the rest of your life. You won't be able to walk again. And, uh, and I respected those medical advice. But something that was in me, and I believe it was inbuilt in me, I will never take a no for an answer. I will always try to find a way to, to pursue what, what was inside of me. Even though I was pronounced that, even though I was told that I won't be able to walk again, I respected all those medical advice, but I said, no, I'll do this again if I can.